Hi, I'm Lisa Norris. Welcome to Corona Logs, a collaboration between my creative writing students and Patrick Disney's theater students. The assignment for my class asked each of the creative writers to come up with an original monologue about the impacts of COVID-19 on human lives. The three-minute monologue could take the form of creative nonfiction, fiction, or poetry. We hope these stories will offer you some company and entertainment as you shelter in your homes. Remember, some of these pieces are about the writer's real lived experience, and others are complete fictions. Thank you for listening. We wish you good health. The general strategy is rather simple. Your host is too heavy for you to steer manually, so you're just going to have to ride with them. Don't fight. Allow yourself to be jostled around a bit. I like to imagine that I'm a dash of smoke in a blown light bulb. As best I can, I try to hover towards the ceiling. Should I lose that position, I just let myself drift back into it, slow and gentle. You're caught as soon as you make your move. There's no, there's no covert way to overtake the lungs, so don't try it. You get into the body and you wait. The host species is incredibly self-centered. When they have a desire for stimulation, they forget all about defense. And you really want to save yourself for that moment. They have a very, very limited tolerance for being farther than five inches away from another pair of nostrils at any given time. But the only way you're going to use this is to be a little bit patient. Instead of going in for the kill, like I said, you'll want to hover around the roof of the mouth, wait for like two or three targets, and then, as quickly and sporadically as you can, trip every alarm in your immediate proximity. Get your host coughing, sneezing, sweating, sweating, rubbing at their vulnerable little eyes. Blast the second target directly if you can. Or, alternatively, at their floor, their shoes, their clothes, anything, doesn't matter. By this point, You've blown your cover. This host is doomed to a dark apartment alone or a hospital bed. That's it. I can't do it anymore, Henry. It's too much. There's too many people in this house. Don't give me that look. You know I love these people. You know I would fight anyone and anything for them. But I can't be in this house another second. Don't think I haven't noticed you spending a lot more time behind the couch than you used to. Yeah, I might be colorblind, but I'm not completely blind, Henry. Don't think your little game of hide-and-seek hasn't gone unnoticed. Well, Henry, I, I know that you agree with me, but... You know, it used to be great. Like, at first, everyone was in the house together all the time, and we were just playing and having fun all day long. It was great. But... Now it's just annoying. We used to have full reign of this house all day long, from morning to early afternoon. Just us, remember? We used to run this place wild. It was a... It was a no man's land type of place. It was an anything goes type of place. But now, now I can't even stretch my legs inside the house anymore. And we have to be good boys. 
No more chasing the cat around the house or leaving my toys everywhere. So what if I want to leave more than two toys out at once? It's not hurting anybody. I swear, Henry, these people are total neat freaks. I mean, I don't remember it being this bad, but they, they, they won't even go anywhere without gloves on anymore. Like, don't they realize how stupid they look? Speaking of looking stupid, you remember that prank we used to pull on them? When we would go outside and find some rocks and hide them in the couch and then wait for them to sit on the couch and find them and oh, their faces were hilarious. And then we would just laugh and then they would come and question us about it and we would just pretend like we didn't know anything. We would just turn our heads away and refuse to speak. <laughs> that was so great. I still can't believe we did that. Henry, Henry, Henry! I think I hear someone calling our names. I think they're taking us for a walk, Henry. Henry, get your paw out of your mouth. Come on, we're going for a walk. Let's go! Hi, my name is Brisa Chavez, and I'll be performing My Best Friend Has Four Paws and Two Feet by Kaylee McLellan. I know you can hear me. You're just choosing to ignore me, which is honestly very rude. No, stop! Get off the table. You knock all my stuff off, and we both know that I'll be the one that has to pick it up. I remember a time before where I could go out and be surrounded by other humans. Now you're the only thing I have to talk to, and you don't even have two legs or a working mouth. You just have four paws and a very noisy little meow, which is the only thing that I can get out of you, even when I'm trying to have a serious conversation about my feelings. And the topic of feelings has become an everyday conversation, sometimes even twice a day. Cut me some slack, though. Besides my family, you're the only thing I have to talk to, and I'm sorry if that's an inconvenience for you. No, please don't try to pretend to know how I feel. If I could, I would be out and interacting with actual human beings, but I can't do that right now. You choose to sit inside 24 seven on a daily basis. So no, I don't feel sorry for you. Unlike me, you can actually go out and play with your neighborhood friends, but you don't. You just sit there with your big green eyes and stare at me. And yes, I can tell that there's judgment. You make me so mad sometimes. You know how lonely I am and you just don't care. All you do is twitch that mushy mop you call a tail and then dig your nails into my backpack. Get off the table! Look, I'm sorry, Gloria. I can tell I'm making you anxious by the way that your fur is sticking up. You have been so patient with me. You let me rant for hours, and I know that must hurt your ears. Not even the tufts of fur in them can block out the sound of my voice, huh? And you let me hold you like a baby and pet you backwards when I'm bored. You even let me cuddle with you. <laughs> you never complain when I squeeze too tight. Not even a little meow. Let's just say that you get my good and my bad side. And I'm sorry for getting so angry. Please forgive me. How about tomorrow? I give your fur a nice brushing. Yeah? Does that sound good? Well, at least meow or something. Really? Still nothing? Okay, we'll work on it tomorrow. Good night, Gloria. I love you. Oh, and please try not to bite my nose while I'm sleeping. It actually hurts very much. Thank you. Hi. 
My name is Cassandra Kirshner, and today I will be performing The Suffocating Butterfly by Yidris Gilden. I wait for the peak of the sun within my cocoon so I can exhale the insanity that the sky is no longer blue for the satisfaction of inhaling normality that flashing stars still grant me a wish. My nails painted for every drop of blood, I claw to feel a breeze as my eyes boil to pus that blinds me to this tone of darkness. The embrace of waves is lost, and I am now molded to every scent poured from my perfumes just to pretend you would come knocking. At least, when you sing upon my apple tree, I know what it is like to embrace the idea to be free. Even if you tease me with how, much, with how much you're free, but visions of what used to be can't hold off the reality that freedom is just a fairy tale. Look at my walls closing at my heart Hardening, so let me out, please! Just so I can know what it's like to embody the warmth of the sun and grasp the sore of freedom with you. But You don't want to save me. You only want to remind me that Mother Nature gave you permission to roam her lands as much as you please. While I suffocate to my last breath to hold on to my sanity to keep safe from an illness that the public does not know who to pinpoint the blame. Thank you. Hi, right, my name is Don Anderson, and I'll be performing Letter to a Very Unstable Genius by Kyle Denner. Dear Ted, the other day, from my bedroom window, I saw an unmanned shopping cart roll down my desolate suburban street, plastic and metal. I'm beginning to think that arsonists are the only artists creating meaningful work. I mean, have you ever looked into a flame or repeated a word so much until it becomes mere noise? I mean, that I believe is how it is to, when you experience God. I mean, what is what in the current system is worth preserving? I mean, the, the, I suspect not much. You told us, and we chose not to listen. Hubris is the real enemy. I, I mean, the terror of modernity is constantly, ceaselessly encroaching upon whatever small traces of dignity that we have left. I mean, my one small—I mean, my one solace is that out of great turmoil can come great change. I mean, in your situation, I mean, a euphemism. I know. <clears throat> I assume that you have very limited access to the outside world. Look, I'll tell you this. The, te the technocrats are so gleeful right now that it's sickening. The bourgeoisie has almost seamlessly transitioned to an online lifestyle. I mean, if you, if you could see it, you would be in disbelief. School children as young as four and five video conferencing as a means of education... Sex via webcam is selling like hotcakes. I mean, I view my job at Dairy Queen as a perverse sort of performance art. I mean, the store itself is, of course, shut down, but 
the drive through is open, so... I mean, people are herded through, wearing their masks, absentmindedly handing money in exchange for ice cream and burgers. I mean, civilization is the disease itself, okay? And steroid-infused burgers, or better yet, steroid-infused beef wrapped in between two buns with thin, wrapped in thin, wrap, thin wax paper. I mean, washed down with an acidic brown or green liquid, thousands of miles removed from Chinese wet markets. I mean, I too find myself chained to the industrialist superstructure, pathetically manacled to to its endless torture of animals and plants and the drive to alienate men and make them passive towards the reductive violence of civilization. I mean, I'm impotently kicking at the base. I mean, I'm hoping to, to move an immovable object. I mean, I'm thinking about doing something big. So far, I've just spiked Pepsi and Mountain Dew with ketamine. I mean, I have larger ideas. But I mean, what, what if John Brown t had turned away from violence? I mean, the wheels of progress m must be halted. I mean, no matter the cost. I mean, I remember you, you once, what you once said. Never lose hope. Be persistent and s be stubborn and never give up. There are many instances in history where... where apparent losers turn out to be winners unexpectedly. So you, you should never conclude that all hope is lost. I mean, my brother says that I'm a loser. You, more so than almost anyone, can appreciate how brothers can be. I'm determined to prove him wrong. And everyone else. Look, I thank you for your time, Professor Kaczynski. Sincerely, affectionately, fondly, and perhaps sycophantically, your admiring pen pal. Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. I imagine that most people wouldn't want to go through puberty for a second time. I mean, it's messy, and it's awful, and your body is constantly changing, and there's this unmistakable feeling that whatever is happening to you can never be undone. So I stare at my bottles filled with pills that my doctors say will turn off my boy juice and turn up my girl juice in a desperate attempt to right the wrong that God has so clearly done to me. You know, sometimes I wonder if this is just a sick joke to her. Like, did you mean to give me that Y chromosome, sis? Or was there a fuck up later down the line? I've got a bunch of people down here telling me that girls aren't supposed to have penises and <laughs> I mean, they're wrong. But sometimes they can be pretty hard to ignore, you know? It's probably the certainty of worldwide isolation that gave me the courage to start the notorious HRT. I mean, I don't even start to get tits till like three months, in which most people take the opportunity to aggressively misgender you, no matter how hard you try in the morning. Yes, Gerald, I put on a choker, a crop top, high-waisted jeans, and a padded bra because I wanted you to call me sir while handing me my Wendy's. <laughs> I'd much rather stay in my home while my hideous body wraps itself in its hormone cocoon and simply come out the other side as a gorgeous butterfly with no one being the wiser. Was she born with it? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> It's Maybelline. Like, a lot of it. It's weird to think that the next time I see my friends, I'll be a new person. I mean, not an altogether different person, but a new one all the same. Maybe we'll all get together and celebrate the death of my old body. It'll be a funeral. And a badass one, too. Like, like a Viking funeral. I'll place all my boy clothes on a raft, 
and shoot a flaming arrow at it. Because what's a rebirth storyline without a phoenix metaphor shoehorned in? I used to be afraid of that fire. But now it's, it's inviting. Like a hearth. And it bathes me in its new warmth until finally I feel all of the shit that's been weighing me down fall off my skin like rain. And suddenly, I'm free. So fuck it. Come at me, puberty. I can take round two. Why do you look sad? The lines etched in your face, small as a hairline fracture, telling the story of your life, are turned upside down. <laughs> Once upon a time, you used to be in such a playful mood. We would go on walks constantly, and I would get all sorts of attention from people. They would pet me and acknowledge me, and I would whack my little tail for them. Now that I have nothing else to do, I wonder, what can I do to bring back that smile? Your eyes are dead as sea glass, staring vacantly out into nothing, when they should be focused on throwing the stick so I can go fetch it. Your eyes once smiled when they entered our little paradise, a paradise too small for my liking. It is our den, our sanctuary. But now, it feels as a cage, and I am starting to feel restless. What? We get to go outside? Yay, bring my bully Wally! Wait. Where are, where are all the people? I miss the pets. Can you bring me to the people to get the pets? Huh? Why do your eyes look so sad? Your heart feels heavy to me. What is my purpose? Such a terrifying question to ask yourself. Of course you have a purpose, silly. To play with me, to let me comfort you. It feels strange here, having you home all the time. Stranger that your eyes still look bleak. When I peer into them, they appear to be dancing with visions of connecting hearts. Is it because you misses the people? I misses the people too. But I have you. And you have me, human. I don't know what's going on. But I'll protect you. Always. Hi, my name is Jessica Waddell, and I will be performing Essential Worker by Sydney Erickson. I've never done therapy through Skype before. Just get started. All of it. Well, all right. I teach kindergarten. And the bright eyes of small children keep me awake at night. Their faces on my laptop screen, their 
scrunched eyebrows and frustrated expressions. The gears in their heads are stuck like clocks and I'm the one who can get them going again. I want to reach out past the screen and sprint down the lines of internet that connect us all. I want to show them how to write their letters, give them the building blocks to learning so they can move on to the next step. But this screen, this wall, separates my home from the lives of 25 children. The families I don't know, the conditions I don't know. My heart breaks for the child with, with parents who don't know how to love. The child that has memorized the rumble of their stomach quicker than their ABCs. But I'm the face they see when they log online. I'm the familiar. With every tiny finger on the district issue Chromebook keyboard, they continue with their lives. And I try to continue with mine. The dark circles under my eyes only get darker. The concealer grows thicker. The 7 a.m. news is like, it's like a heavy chain wrapped around my shoulders and every day it grows heavier. I have little to keep me going but my coffee and my kids. The days just blend into each other like watercolors. <laughs> I realized today that I haven't done the dishes in two weeks. <laughs> my sink smells like spoiled milk but I guess my nose got used to it. As I draft worksheet upon worksheet, I'm tempted to grab my phone and, and text my ex with the commitment issues so I can just feel like there's someone there for me. But when I log on to the only faces I get to see, they don't notice my dirty sweatpants. They don't notice my smile that is too tired to climb up my cheeks and reach my eyes or the tears that slipped into my glass of red last night. All they see is their teacher. The steadiness of my existence. And that's what they need. I have to be there for them. What can I do to get my life back together? Thank you. Moonlight sinks pastels into the gravel bank on the far side of the river, lighting the grays and greens in blues and grays, highlighting pressure and connection a mountain formation of closeness and distance. It's like this sometimes, waking mid-sleep to find what we have hidden on the other side of the river. Tonight I see a doe pick her way down under fleets of floating cottonwood dust from the snowy canyon towards the river in search of something that once was blue. I shiver, peer, my nose pressed against the cold glass, isolating my bare prickling arms from the outside preventing them from reaching across the gravel, the grass, the river, over the cottonwood buds, mooring in the water, and touching her on the crown of her head. Even now, my being sunken into complete darkness of the cabin, she stares at me from her bank. Me, the unmoving voyeur to her necessities. She stares beyond me. She chooses her steps, paws the ground, proves the gravel true, peers back at what's peering out. Her blank black eyes shine a light on movement. Is it the left breast of my t-shirt she sees? Thump, thump, thump. My breath expanding and contracting. Contacting humidity, spotting bare glass. Lowered extended fingers outlining unconscious octaves, a composition in the dark. Or does she just see herself in the reflection of the glass? Leaving the window, the buds anchored in ripples, 
and the doe to the river. To the cold feeling of the water, she laps in her hanging tongue, my bare feet across the threshold, picking their way, proving dusty hardwood true back into the bedroom. My thoughts stay firmly placed beyond the window, though, hoping a parade of sticky starburst buds, orange fading to white, and a doe thirsty for two, this spring awake with us all, and new life. Listen, you've been following me around this house for days now, weeks actually, always right on my heels and just out of sight. I turn around to catch you, but you just stay right behind me. But don't deny it's you because there's no one else here and there can be no one else here since, well, since the day they declared there couldn't be, okay? What changed today? Why present yourself in front of me now? If you're going to stay, you might as well talk to me. Well? Fine then. If you won't talk, then I will. I look especially lovely today, don't you think? I'm sporting my favorite pair of sweatpants and a graphic tee that reads, The Universe is Shady. Something you can relate to. <laughs> and my messy bun is exquisitely messy indeed, don't you think? <laughs> You know, I think this arrangement will work great. You're so agreeable. <laughs> it's been quite some time since I've met anyone who will agree with anything I say. I tried to get Chris more agreeable, for his own good, but he never listened. It was just simple hygiene. Wash your hands after going to the bathroom, close the toilet seat and the lid, for God's sake. I mean, I understand the toilet lid thing. Not everyone does that, but washing your hands? Come on, I should not have had to work that habit on him. Well, I guess I don't have to worry about that anymore. Not since he, well, not since this whole pandemic happened and he, well, you know what happened and I don't want to talk about it anymore. Oh, what, now you have an opinion? Your bun does not look better than mine. It's the same shape. If anything, mine is sharper than yours. I'm a sharper person than you in shape and mind. Whatever, can we move on? Where are you going? I didn't mean physically move on. Yeah, that's my front door. It is a nice day out, but we can't go out there. Why? Well, the world is falling apart out there, and I'd like to wait for some of the debris to settle before going back out there. We have all we need right in this house. Food, water, Wi-Fi, toilet paper, which a lot of people can't say they have. Plants, and now I have you to keep me company. I do not need new plants. My plants are just fine. Yeah, I see them. You don't have to point them out. I don't know what you're talking about. They're just sagging like that because there's not a lot of sunlight on them right now. It gives them character. What? What do you know? The only color you have is grayish black, which is barely a color to begin with. What do you know? I, I, I can't talk to you anymore. It's not worth the company. Detach yourself from my feet and go away. I'm going in my room and turning out all the lights and you can't follow me in. What was that? I can't see you. It's official, Harley. Corona's got me for loathed. I know we're not in a special position because of this, clearly, but I'm kind of relieved. I mean, there was so much tension in our department that a break almost felt required. 
you remember me telling you about how everyone was just so worn out from crunch time and how angry we were all getting at each other? Well, now everyone can just take a breather and be home for a bit. Now I'm thinking about stuff that I have the opportunity to get done around here. I can dust the window sills, clean your fur out of the crevices at the staircase, and maybe even check out what that noise behind the fridge is. If it's a mouse, I hope he's heard of social distancing. See, the garage also needs to be cleaned. You need to be brushed. I need to clean my bedding. God knows those dishes can't wash themselves. But the difference between this and my paying job is that all of this housework is stuff that I can do on my own terms. I'm not a cop for a while. My, my house is like you, Harley. They're both things that need to be clean and, and pay attention to. And I'm happy to do all the work. And that's the thing. I'm happy with our situation. I'm not sick, and no one I know in the department was sick either. And I don't have to deal with office bullshit where everyone is just so pissy at each other. I, I When I'm here, I get to be thinking about stuff that I've got going on in our domain. I'm even excited to not leave home for a while. But the problem starts when I think about why all of this is happening. Am I allowed to be happy? Are my feelings valid when the whole human race is experiencing this? I'm lucky no one I know has gotten sick, but what about the people I don't know? They have lost people that they loved and cared about. You wouldn't smile at a funeral, right? I don't know. The last thing humans should be doing right now is suppress our feelings. But it feels weird. <laughs> but when I get home and you greet me by the door, though, I sink into this world that I never want to leave. Part of me wouldn't have it any other way. And I just want you to know that. Hi, my name is Christopher Simmons, and today I will be performing the monologue Sleeping In Today by Haley Taylor. I'm sleeping in today. Before you say anything, Annie, I, I know how late it is, but time doesn't even matter anymore. It moves by quickly, acting like a gust of wind. It alters directions before we notice the change in weather. It turns into the next day without warning, and not in the way it would before. It's not like when we spent the whole night painting the living room and we didn't know it was the next day until the light from outside started dawning on the walls. It's not like we, we'd we stay up for Harry Potter marathons when we were in college and we'd say, wow, it's already tomorrow, when we looked at the time. It's not like that anymore because now there are no tomorrows. There's, <laughs> there's only now, the infinite now. We're in this never-ending day. Sunsets don't feel final, and sunrises don't look like beginnings. So what's the point of getting up at all? We wake up to the same news every morning. Some people will listen to the safety precautions, others will ignore them, and then both groups will yell at each other. We'll have to stay trapped inside because the virus is polarizing us. Well, I, I guess we've always been polarized. The virus is just showing us how far we've grown apart all this time. Don't give me that look, Annie. I wasn't talking about us. I know things have been off with us lately, that our conversations are all starting to sound identical. We haven't gone on that trip to Italy, the one we said we'd take when we both had time off work. We haven't tried again for a baby like you wanted us to because the timing has never felt right. We do our, we do our own thing in the the house most days without much notice of the other until we sit at the dinner table. But we aren't divided like we are from everyone else. We're just, we're just used to each other, used to the way things are. That's all that's been slowing us down. You should get up. Once this all ends, I'll, 
I'll start getting out of bed with you. It'll be just like it was before. Make sure to close the door on your way out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Cassidy, and I will be performing a monologue called Pretty Please by Alyssa Brandt. Dear Mr. Governor, I'm going to need you to uncancel prom. I know everyone's worried about this virus and stuff, but we're high school seniors. We're young, so it's not like we have anything to be concerned about. I mean, I know for whatever reason, they always end up picking the oldest people to be the chaperones, but they can just, like, not do that this time. Or they can just, like, pick the youngest teachers or something. Or, even better, they can just not have any chaperones. Prom would be much better like that anyway. Here's the thing. I bought my dress in September, so obviously it's way too late to return it. And where am I going to wear it if prom is canceled? Church? As if! There's nothing else I can do with it. So, if you're not going to let me have my senior prom, then are you going to at least reimburse me for the $375 that I paid for my dress? And, like, all of my friends, too? Yeah. I didn't think so! I bet you remember your senior prom, right? Think about it. Think about the great time you probably had that me and my classmates will never get to experience. Do you realize how selfish you're being? Look, I know that I must sound really demanding, but I've been looking forward to this since elementary school. Honestly, I don't have a lot going for me. Like, I'm not that smart and I'm not really very good at anything. Prom was supposed to be the highlight of high school and I won't even have that to look back on. Also, it's a rite of passage. Missing out on that kind of makes me an outsider. Sort of like the girls who go alone or people just don't care about it. Except I had a date and I do care about it, but I'm still getting screwed over. I think the worst part about it is probably my older sister. She's back home from college because she has to do school online now. And she won't stop talking about how great her prom was. She basically said it was life-changing, and I'll never be able to understand that. She's so smug about it. And if I don't get this prom, she won't stop tormenting me. So please, Mr. Governor, pretty, pretty please, let me have my senior prom. Let the class of 2020 feel alive for one more night before we're done with high school forever. Sincerely, Stacey K. My friend just called the third time this week. And she's going on about COVID-19 and how worried she is for her family and her dog Diffie and her hamster, Sir Flexington the third. She's worried about how Diffie not, might not have enough food to eat and how Sir Flexington the third might not have enough of his colored sheets that he sleeps on. I mean, she's worried about a lot of things and she tells me during these calls. And I mean, it's been 30 long minutes and all I've had to say is mmms and uhs. Mm. I feel bad for her. I really do. But she calls at the worst possible times. I mean, the last time she called, I was in the middle of an episode of 90210. Um, not, the, not the old one, the remake. And I have... I really have to finish the show before this whole stay-at-home order lifts, and then I can go back to my normal life. I mean, Annie's being blackmailed. Naomi is having relationship issues. And Silver, I don't even know who Silver is even having feelings for. And my friend is sniffling 
on the phone. She is talking so fast I cannot even understand her. So I try to comfort her. And then when she started to calm down, I went to I went upstairs to go and grab my third bag of popcorn. And I know that once I put it in the microwave, it starts to beep that once I take it out and press play again, it'll be nice and warm. So I tell her I have to go. But then she asks, why? She asks why? And so I tell her, I tell her I have to go and clean the house because I know that that is the only thing that will give her some form of closure, some form of comfort, and that will actually get her off the phone. She asks, really? And I say, really? And we say goodbyes, and she hangs up. And so I go back upstairs, and I'm watching my popcorn bag inflate pop by pop by pop, but I can't even hear this pop because her friend is ringing in my ears. It's the constant talk about her issues, her worries, about her friends and family. Don't go outside, she says. Wash your hands, she says. Be careful, she says. This could last forever, she says. I mean, how long of a time this popcorn in the microwave beep for, I will never know. And so, I take the popcorn out, it's already cooled. And I told myself I was going to limit myself to one bag of popcorn per day. Hello, I'm Mason Alwood, and this is The Wood Wall after Charlotte Perkins Gilman by Catherine Mann. You know, even though I hate to leave the house, having the option to was nice. I miss being able to go to the park. I hate actually going. The bees harass my eardrums, and the trees throw leaves and needles that stick to my skin. But having the option to was nice. But with the virus, the lockdown, and the risk of, you know, dying, I don't have the option anymore. My apartment is small, minimalist. The blank plankboard walls are old, loose, and creaky. There's an empty bookshelf there, a little TV there. The thing in the corner is maybe a chair, but it's too old to tell anymore. I mean, I can't afford much more. I can't really afford anything anymore. I can't really do anything anymore. You know, I really shouldn't have read the yellow wallpaper. I feel for the narrator. She's cooped up because her husband doesn't think she can handle doing much of anything without getting sick. I'm cooped up because the governor doesn't think I can handle doing anything without getting sick. She just wants some company, someone to listen to. But the only person she could talk to is her husband and sister-in-law. I just want some company, someone to talk to. But the only person who listen is my cat, Lotion. She had to create something in her mind, so she had something to do. All I can do is sit here, read stuff on my phone, and listen. I listen to the news, the doom and gloom. I listen to my neighbors fighting over TP next door, and I want to tell them to shut the hell up just because I want to interact with someone else. <laughs> I listen to silence, but it isn't always silent. I could hear something, a little tick, tick, tick noise. I tried to tell my landlord, but he told me it was a rat and that it didn't matter. It gets louder the longer I'm stuck inside. There's someone banging on the walls. 
And if I put my ear to it, I can hear someone begging to be let out. Whoever they are is young. No older than a college student, for sure. Their voice isn't as breathy as a girl's next door or as gruff as her boyfriend's. Sometimes when they talk, they whisper. A quiet question, please let me out. I could barely hear it over the two next doors or lotion asking for pets. Other times when it's quiet, they're louder. They're not begging, they're crying, sobbing, please help me, let me go. No one else has complained about the noise, so the landlord put off the visit till later this evening. Non-essential travel, you know. I walk the one-room apartment, tapping on the walls, hoping that they'll tap back. I want to help them. Get someone to talk to, to listen. I hear a loud thunk when I tap the spot just behind the TV. It crashes on the ground when I knock it over, glass spilling everywhere. It hurts to step on the shards, but the person in the wall needs me. The boards are loose enough to break off if I try, so I do. I don't care if it hurts, breaks my nose when the first board comes off. It does hurt a little. Just enough to make me stop for a second, but I keep going. I claw, rip, and tear at the walls, taking chunks of insulation and fingernails with them. They're screaming now from the wall behind me. My landlord's barely in the door before he collapses. I guess my sideways nose and bloody fingers shocked him. He's on the floor now, in the way. Every time I try to follow their screams, I have to step over him. Hello, my name is Michaela Das. I will be performing a Corona log entitled Boy Trouble by Dianica Marie Lulowski. Thank you. I know, I know, I know. We aren't supposed to leave the house, but I go to work every day anyway. I mean, I'm with random people all day. Seeing him will make a difference since I'm with people all day. If anything, it's safer to see him because I know he doesn't have it rather than a bunch of strangers I don't even know. I just miss him, Mom. And he's been hanging out with this other girl lately. I don't know. I just don't like it. I mean, I don't want to tell him he can't hang out with her or anything. I don't want to be the controlling girlfriend, telling him who he can't hang out with. But why is he hanging out with her anyway? We aren't supposed to go out unless we have to. And he doesn't have to see her. I want to talk to him about it, but I don't want him to think that I'm trying to control him or anything. Would that be controlling? Is it normal for a guy to hang out with another girl like that even if he has a girlfriend? Did you, did dad hang out with other girls when you guys were dating? I mean, they just play video games and stuff. And he says that she's more of a bro to him. But how can she be a bro? She's a girl. They've been friends since like elementary school, I guess. So I can't just tell him to stop hanging out with her. I know that he wouldn't cheat on me or anything. I just don't like him hanging out with other girls like that. Mom, I'm trying to have a serious conversation with you right now. Could you stop washing the dishes for one second? I really want to see him. We've been talking less and less lately. I'm always at work or he's sleeping or whatever. I don't care if I'm not supposed to go out, but I need to see people. Maybe you're fine of Nobody but the dogs to talk to, but I'm not. Like, come on, isn't it kind of messed up that he hangs out with another girl more than his own girlfriend? I, I'm not blaming him. 
And it's not his fault, though, because I'm not allowed to go out besides work. And I'm not blaming him or anything for hanging out with another girl. She is his friend, and he's probably bored. I hang out with a guy friend if I have the time. And a guy friend. So, can I go over to his house tomorrow? We're just going to watch movies and hang out and stuff. And his mom is going to be there too. It's not like we're going to be alone. I'm scared. I'm going to lose him, Mom. Thank you. Let me explain. Uh, sir, what was your name again? Oh, right. Jake. Mr. Jake the manager. Listen, don't call the cops. Please. Look, there's this Jersey Shore Photoshop asshole standing like two feet away from me in line. At first, I do a little scoot away thing. A little exaggerated... You know? To let him know that I'm uncomfortable. I tried is what I'm saying, okay? So I turn and look at him. This jerk who's living like it's still January 2020. I think about asking if he's read the news, but then I remember that there are like three different storylines about the shit. And I don't know. Maybe he's the guy with the Infowars sticker in the truck in the parking lot. <laughs> Did you see the Donald Trump impersonator? There will be a complete and total ban, okay? It's going to be the greatest ban in history. <laughs> I think he's one of these right-wing guys, that's the point. I feel like InfoWars guys can pop off. And then you put a workout bro in that mix? <clears throat> I mean, I have testosterone too. But this guy is liable to want to start throwing it down in the parking lot if I piss him off. And then he starts browsing the gum right behind me on the little checkout display. I can feel him closing in on me, picking up random gum packs and placing them back on the rack. I turn around and, like, your security camera is going to show, I shouted at the guy. I can't deny it. Yeah, well, he is a motherfucker. I know, I know, it scared the old ladies leaving the senior hour. But who actually started it? You know? Me? Really? Can you just let me off with a warning? I shop here all the time. Well, a little less since March. But, you're the closest grocery store to my house. If anyone should be banned, it's the selfish jerk that started the whole thing. Oh, really? Well, just wait until I get home. People are going to hear about this. You better believe it. Hello, my name is Michael Christensen, and this is Homeless Expat by Rebecca Pasaturi. I wonder if my apartment was always this dirty, this bare. I swept this morning, and already the dust particles from the heavy pollution gather in the corners, standing out against my cherry redwood floors. I wonder if my government will fight to get me back, or if they'll decide it's too dangerous and that I should stay here in my apartment as my visa runs out, and I struggle to find food with my limited Mandarin. I've been under mandatory lockdown for almost uh, two weeks. 
I never minded the loneliness before. You get used to the quiet when no one speaks your language or wants to be friends with the strange, fat foreigner who can't get his tones right. On my grimy window, I watch the dust fall on the abandoned street that used to be overcrowded with ditties honking their horns. People on electric scooters weaving between them. Squatters yelling out food prices. <laughs> well, before the police shut them down. Eerie silence suffocates even the most introverted. I think about calling a friend, but my American friends have long since stopped checking up on me. Long distance friendships are too much effort for most people. If I go home, maybe I can rekindle some of those relationships. My phone lights up with an email from my boss. He must have received news from the U.S. Embassy about what they decided to do with us foreigners stuck in the middle of the pandemic. The words stare at me as I struggle to understand. Am I to remain here, locked in my apartment for maybe weeks? <laughs> maybe for months? Maybe a year? My doorbell jolts me out of my trance. It must be my food delivery. At last, I can finally see another human being. As I open the door, smiling through my mask, the delivery man drops my food. His eyes grow large. I can see in them my white face, mingled with the fear of foreigners bringing in the virus. He stutters running away, leaving my food splattered over my feet. My home country doesn't want me, and neither does China. Thank you. Look at me like that. You tried to eat Kyle's two day leftovers off the dresser yesterday. You don't get to judge me for my 3 a.m. shame eating. If you're nice to me, I might share. And you need to remember that. Kyle never shares with you. Because he sucks, and I don't. You know what he said at dinner? Apparently, my issue shouldn't be an issue anymore. Not while we're stuck in this stupid apartment and not able to leave. Isn't it funny that my boyfriend still refers to my diagnosed eating disorder as an issue? Not like he hasn't been around for the vomit and therapy. He said, Katie, who are you trying to impress? We're here for the next month and I love you no matter what. Apparently, him being okay with how I look is enough to keep me from throwing up. He doesn't get it. He's always in control, you know? You never catch him making mac and cheese at 3 in the morning. And he acts like this is something I want, you know? Of course, you don't know. You're a fucking animal. You have no control over what you eat. Not really. Maybe that's what he needs to do. Pretend I'm an animal. Lock me out of the kitchen and only feed me portion controlled meals twice a day. Not like it would work anyway. Him taking control wouldn't help me. I just find a different way to feel like I have some sort of grasp on my life. Not like I can manage much else after this stupid pandemic took everything else away. Maybe tonight will be different. You and I can go back to bed. I can stop eating when I'm full. I can put the Cheetos away and not feel like total shit when I wake up tomorrow morning. I can do that, right? You know what would taste great with mac and cheese? 
Pizza rolls. You want pizza rolls? I want pizza rolls. Don't tell Kyle, alright? Thank you. Hello, young man. I'm so glad the groceries are here, but you caught me in my curlers. I don't know why I bother when they say old ladies like me aren't supposed to be out during this corona mess. Oh, Copper! Quiet! Oh, don't mind him. He's all bark. Hush up now! Oh, he's not gonna stop. I'll step out onto the porch. Oh, don't worry. I'm six feet away. <laughs> six feet away. Good heavens. This an entire box of fish? I don't remember ordering this much. <laughs> You'd think my husband Arnie was still alive. <laughs> He'd have that box devoured in a couple of days. <laughs> oh, catfish was his specialty and you know, he'd smother it in Cajun spices and butter and, oh, it was good. When he cooked it, me and the kids would come down to the kitchen and grab our plates and just wait for him to scoop some onto our plate. Oh, I've never tasted anything like it. It was so tasty. Man, with all this fish, me and Copper might be able to cook some up tonight. What do you think about that, Copper? Hey, get down from the screen door like that. Don't jump on it. You know that. Uh, oh, hold up, young man. Don't leave just yet. I need to make sure that everything's here. The last boy that delivered my groceries left out my coffee, and I went an entire week with coffee withdrawal headaches because of him. It's not like an old lady like me can just go out to the grocers whenever she likes with all those corona germs hovering about. Now let's see here. This is a good brand. It's from the Murray Ray Farms, right? It's tasty, but nothing beats fresh catfish. Oh, Arnie, he would fish in the river behind our house almost every night in the summer. He worked as a postman at the post on Oak Street, just about a block from here. And yeah, he'd come home every day after work and he'd change out of his postal uniform and put on his vest and his hat and his ratty pair of jeans and grab his pole. And oh, he fished every night that summer. This is okay, now let's see here. This other box. Oh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I saw Arnie wear much else unless we were going to church. <laughs> One time he wore his fishing garb to church. I was so embarrassed. I cried the whole drive home and he wore his dress shirt and slacks every Sunday after that. <laughs> oh, goodness me. You've got so many deliveries to do and here I am talking your day away. Oh, looks like this virus is gonna be around for a while, so I'll need another delivery next week. Let's see here, I think I've got a list for next week in my pocket. Yeah, here it is. Let me just, just see if I forgot anything. Eggs, cheese, rice, coffee. Oh, I don't see fish on the list. I better add one more box. My name is Reese Sigmund, and this is The Little Things by Gwyn Caldwell. Someone to stroke my hair and tell me that everything is okay, that everything will be okay. But it is the one thing I cannot have. Touch has become poison. Our flesh and the flesh of our neighbors have become chariots for despair and fear. Every word is of the plague. Every corridor of conversation comes back to an uncertain world that threatens to collapse under its own mistakes. It is real. Even though it feels like a nightmare, every day I expect to wake up. But 
but still, there are little miracles. They come in the shapes of bees that rumble from plant to plant, pushing open the flowers. They come in the form of music, of the songs shared over back fences and from balconies, in the faces flowing from our screens, giving us new voices, new stories, new experiences, in the smell of smoke and firelight below the stars. It is the feeling of sunlight after spending too long in the shade. They come in the form of pink splatter jeans and pricked fingertips in hot cross buns and hot chocolate before the dawn, in comfortable clothes and indulgent stories, in being able to believe that you will still be here when this is over. These little miracles are our prayers to our sanity, hymns to the hopeful and the tired. The ones who try to make the most of things because that's all we can do. Not hate, not pain, not fear, not blame, not sadness, but hope and charity and love. Someone will hold you again. Someone will wrap their arms around you and kiss around your skin and tell you how much they love you. It's a, it's a, a terrible time to be touch starved, but when we come back together, oh, the, the meeting will be all the sweeter and, and we'll curl up in the backyard and I will tell you of all the moments I wish I could have shared with you and you will tell me yours. We will spill our secrets into the quiet and I will cherish every moment. Live for the hope of a hug and your hands holding hands without fear. Thank you. Hey, I think I lost you for a second there. Um, anyways, I was talking about, okay, so I was in line and I'm thinking, Carol, you're here for a reason, stay put. And I see the line grow behind me wrapping around the store and I can't back out now. Yet I still find myself glancing longingly at my car in the parking lot. Maybe if I could just grab some takeout for us instead. But Jeff would not be happy about that. I could just hear him saying, I make the money, I make the decisions. And then he would hide away in his home office, laughing at his Zoom meetings. Peeking his graying head out, only to demand more food. You'd think he hadn't cooked a day in his life. I knew when my husband asked me what was for dinner that we were in trouble. I'd been trying to hold off going to the grocery store as long as I possibly could. At night when I'd watch the news, I saw video clips of long lines wrapped around buildings, shelves completely bare, and people hoarding food like it, it was a, an apocalypse. But we aren't there yet, right? I mean, the world isn't ending, or maybe people overbuying and frenzied reactions are what causes the world to end, not the actual pandemic. No, stop it. Stop it, Carol. You can't let your mind go there yet. Meanwhile, I hadn't budged an inch in line, and... Western Washington is having an abnormally hot, warm day. 
And to be honest, I'm terrified that the store might not even have the food I need for my four kids and husband. I have teen boys. They, they could eat entire cows. How am I supposed to get two weeks worth of food when there's not even two works, two weeks worth of food in the grocery store? I noticed a young woman, probably around 20 years old or so, and she's at the front of the line trying to get back in where her mom's standing, and the employees manning the line are shaking their heads, and a man, a couple people ahead of me is yelling at her to go to the end of the line, and other people start yelling, too, and they're angry and frustrated. I mean, we've been waiting for an hour with the sun melting away our humanity bit by bit, and I hear my own voice wobbly and scared join in with the others demanding that the young woman go to the end of the line and wait her turn all over again. Who have I become? <sighs> A Corona Log by Claire Penfield Performed by Luis Hernandez. My mom still takes my nephews to visit my grandma down the road. We scold each other. I tell her to stop, and she reminds me that grandma should have died six months ago. She's on borrowed time, I'm told every time I deliver my family groceries. My mind goes to the middle of the summer. A 4 a.m. phone call, and driving to the UW Medical Center with puffy eyes. She wasn't expected to leave the hospital. But now, more than six months later, she's home, and there's a virus that could kill her. Over 70? COPD? Heart failure? On oxygen? She's not scared. The aneurysm could take her at any second. I can't help but to make my grandpa elbow promise me to stay inside, giving me his mail key and debit card to buy groceries. I wipe down cereal boxes and leave them at the door. I couldn't hug my grandma after she fell. She greeted me through her screen door, and I saw blood-stained lips, red-purple patches, and cuts on her arm. She tells me she wants me to come inside and visit, that the rest of the family still does. I don't come in. I don't hug her. I remind her of the virus, but she doesn't care. After, th after things get better, I'll come in. I try to reassure her and myself, hoping, hoping she's still alive when the virus is gone. Things have changed. The sky is a bit bluer, the sun a bit brighter. As we walk along the trails, dirty needles no longer pierce the flesh of our paws, and we can traipse like we've never been able to before. The two legs have disappeared, for they are weak with sickness and stuck in their homes. But our ways cannot change. The warnings have only paused. We need to stay alert. The two legs that walk along the path may look small, but they possess a power we could never dream of achieving. I know you feel it's safe, and it is for now. But once the wind changes, we can't find hope to fight them. 
I've seen cousins killed and them laugh while they take our pelts home as treasure. Never take the bait. A piece of meat alone in the brush is not luck. The naive will listen to the growl of their bellies, but you must be smarter than that. You are smarter than that. Do you understand? They see our lives as a game. With the two legs, creatures, we are their prey. Like the deer that we hunt, we must run, but faster. So savor the sweetness of this air that we now breathe. Feast on the prey that has multiplied over the past few moons, but know that it is may not last, because once they come back, they will be ravenous for the hunt. Promise me, my son, that you will not be prey.